Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening for the talk of Lexington in the time of COVID-19. My name is Anthony Mead, and I'm the director of the Moreland Gallery here at Transylvania University, which means that it is my distinct honor and privilege not only to work with Kurt and Cremena, who we'll be hearing from tonight, um, but also to welcome them and introduce them tonight. Before we get started, I did wanna let you know that we do have closed captioning available. If you'd like to use that feature, you can take your mouse down to the bottom of the screen where you'll find the little CC icon and just go ahead and click that and it'll turn on closed captioning for you. We also have a Q&A button down there and we'll have a short question and answer session at the end of the talk tonight. So if you wanna engage with the question and answer, it's kind of like a chat function and you can go ahead and click on that Q&A button and it will pull up a little chat and you can type in questions at any point actually throughout the talk tonight and we'll just get to those towards the end. Tonight's talk is part of a current online gallery exhibition by Moreland Gallery. And if you haven't yet, after the talk tonight, please head over to transy.edu slash Moreland to check out the online gallery. I also wanted to say a huge thank you to Charlie Campbell, who was our web designer for that. Charlie did a really, really amazing job on the Lexington in the time of COVID-19 online gallery. And he was just a true joy to work with. So Charlie, if you're here tonight, thank you so much for all the work that you did. As you are no doubt aware, Kerr and Cremena really love people. Um, so it should come as no surprise to you that when we were discussing what we were gonna do with the artist talk tonight, they were like, we should have participants from the project that are on the panel with us. So with that, we are going to be joined by three individuals um, who participated in Lexington in the time of COVID-19. Those are Uma Jules, Brandy Shoemake, and Clay Shields. And I have to say that when I sat down to think about how to introduce Kurt and Cremena, it felt a little silly because after all, all of you who are watching likely know Kurt and Cremena already, either as teachers or as friends or family members or colleagues or community members. You're probably more asking yourself, who is this guy who's talking to me right now? Because for myself, I've only been here in Lexington for a little over a year and a lot of that has been during a pandemic where I've been hiding in my house. But when I first got to Lexington and I started asking around who are the members of the Lexington art community that I should really talk to, repeatedly two names came up over and over again and those were Kurt and Cremena. And then when I got to Transylvania University, there they were with open hearts and open minds in open arms because that was also back when we could hug each other. But I will do my absolute best to try to honor them with an introduction tonight. Kremena Todorova is an associate professor of English here at Transylvania University. She earned her BA from Hope College in 1997 and her MA in 2001, followed by a PhD in 2003 from the University of Notre Dame. And Kurt Godey is a professor of art here at Transylvania University. He received his BFA from New York State College of Ceramics at Alfred University in 1995, and an MFA from Syracuse University in 1998. Together, Kurt and Cremena have captured photographs at the periphery of American culture where drag queens, discarded couches, and abandoned motel signs exist. And currently, they are capturing photographs of, well, us in our homes and in our yards and on our porches. Their work has been seen collectively uh, or collaboratively rather in Boulder, Indianapolis, Lexington, Louisville, Antananta, New York, San Antonio, and Venice Beach. <laughs> and it's been doing everything from engaging with community members through tattooed poetry on their own bodies, 
documenting discarded furniture and now documenting Lexingtonians as we navigate these challenging times that we live in. Their works always engage thoughtfully and caringly and tell stories of places and peoples in unique and interesting ways. So with that, everyone, please join me in virtually welcoming Kurt and Cremena. Anthony, thank you so much for this introduction. I don't know if we deserve this introduction, but um, I felt embraced, even though we don't give each other hugs um, in these times. Um, so we want to thank you for inviting us to do this exhibit back in late spring of 2020. Um, and like you, we also really want to thank Charlie Campbell, who said yes to working with us on um, creating this exhibit. Um, and he designed the website for us and we spoke with him about two months ago, which was when we knew for sure that it would have to be an online um, exhibit. But we want to begin with that before we say anything else, we want to begin with an audio clip and it's one of the um, clips that people can listen to um, on the website. Hi, I'm Anthony Smallwood. Dean and I first moved to Lexington over 30 years ago and during that time, we've lived in Minnesota for four years and England in two years, but we've been back in Lexington for the last 13 years. We always come back home to Lexington. The question, describe the America you'd like to live in. I think I'd like to live in the America that's free from hate, around people with kindness and respect for others. I'd like to live in the America that Louis Armstrong sang about. I see trees of green, Red roses, too. I see them bloom for me and for you, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. I see skies of blue and clouds of white, the bright blessed day and the dark sacred night, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. The colors of the rainbow so pretty in the sky are also on the faces of the people going by. I see friends shaking hands, saying, how do you do? They're really saying, I love you. <laughs> Sounds like a pretty good place to me. What do you think? So that was, that was the, the voice of Anthony. And um, we first met Anthony uh, in 2009, actually. 2009 2010 like some of the other early participants in the project anthony is someone that we've known for a while but as the project went on we met many many new people um the first time we actually met anthony was also the first time we got to hear a drag queen sing uh with her own voice this is actually the second time uh we saw helena handbasket um compete for miss merry christmas and by that time we knew knew her as a as someone who sings um but her second time, the outfits were way more fantastic, at least in the pictures that we have. So um, we really wanted to share this image just um, to kind of put some context in the duration of time we've known some of the people that were photographed. But now we want to go to, uh, we want to go back to the beginning um, and talk about when and why we started Lexington in the time of COVID-19. We'll begin with our own photographs. Um, on March 16, 2020, which was a cold day. It was 40 degrees. It, it was cold, it felt miserable. We photographed each other in front of our own homes. Um, this was the officially the day the pandemic started uh, in Lexington and, and in Kentucky. It was the day uh, universities, public schools, libraries, churches and other faith communities, restaurants and coffee places all closed. Gyms followed the next day we were asked to begin practicing social distancing. And at the time, everything seemed really uncertain and really kind of scary. Um, and so we thought that what we could do is um, photograph people outside of their homes uh, from at least six feet away. And our goals at the time were um, to connect people with each other, um, not necessarily the people who already knew each other, but Lexingtonians living in um, all different parts of the city. We were also hoping that our photographs would offer hope that collectively we could get through this pandemic. 
And we also wanted to document because we were aware that we were living and we still are in a really different time. Um, and we wanted to have a record of people's lives um, at this time. So we would always take a picture and we would also ask people to talk to us about um, how they were managing and what was going on in their lives. And the stories became part of the artwork as well. Initially, we photographed every day. Uh, on the average, we photographed three different people or, or groupings of people, three different places. And we posted two of our photographs to Facebook. At the beginning, we were really concerned about um, social distancing. We were worried that people might disapprove of what we were doing. Um, and so Ebony is the very first person we photographed the next day, the 17th of March. We took this picture of her and then this other picture as well. And we decided that we didn't want to post the first picture because people might, some people might assume that we were really close to her. So we, we uh, went with this picture. And so um, this became the standard for the artwork. Most of the time people, we see people with, with their full bodies in the picture. And most of the time there seems to be a visible distance between us and uh, the people we photographed. Even so, we continued to worry at the time that, that some people might not be convinced that we're keeping our distance. And so Kurt photographed me taking a picture of Marissa, and then I photographed him uh, taking a picture of Daphne and Tommy. And we posted this to Facebook just to reassure people we're staying away, we're at least six feet away. Um, we also thought we would um, photograph Kurt, photo or I, I photographed Kurt photographing Anthony, and there is Anthony. Um, at the time we were talking about this exhibit and we felt it was appropriate for Anthony to um, experience what it was like to be a part of this artwork. So Kurt photographed Anthony and Jessica, but we ended up using my picture when we posted on Facebook. Uh, I, I should say before I go to the next picture, um, that's because Corinne and I always take two pictures. Each one of us takes a picture and uh, then it becomes somewhat of a, a joke competition uh, as to which picture will be selected. Um, and often uh, we like both pictures and then we take it to the board of uh, trustees, which is also just the two of us. Um, as we are traveling around taking photographs, many kind of incredible and, and magical things happen. Um, these two uh, people, Susan and David, uh, met us wearing their um, the clothes they wore when they were married. Um, they kind of had this photograph planned, which harkens back to the Laugh-In, which if, for those of you that don't know, is the precursor to Saturday Night Live. Um, and also a few other photographs they had planned. But in addition, they delivered a monologue kind of performance to us where we became the, the only audience as they uh, performed monologue from their, their porch, which was a pretty magical experience. And we photographed uh, Justin and Rachel. Uh, we were became in some ways their de facto official wedding photographers uh, when we photographed them um, just three hours before they got married on Zoom. As we traveled around, um, people would offer us food and drinks uh, repeatedly because that is uh, what we all have come to understand as, as being hospitable and welcoming people. And we um, unfortunately had to turn them down. Uh, we had a couple rules early on. One was to not go into anyone's homes, even though often people would say, come in and sit down. And the second was to not, not offer anything. But this is a, a friend of ours, Danny. Um, and you can see that he had uh, prepared two pieces of cake for us that also happened to match his flowers. And Lauren and Dan uh, had prepared to uh, share a mixed drink with us, uh, which we had to turn down also um, because we drove to their house, which seemed to make it a wise decision. And sometimes, um, well, they don't even know what to say. Sometimes Batman met us. Uh, we, we scheduled an appointment and then uh, instead of um, Frankie, uh, we were met with by Batman. One time um, we were met uh, by a family, uh, you know, four people, three of them enthusiastically wearing shirts that were designed um, by a friend of theirs that uh, as kind of zoom in, are made specifically to quote our governor. Uh, so this is early on in the pandemic and the governor is given daily um, press briefings. And this was a saying that everyone uh, started to love. So this is kind of a, a meme turned into a real life experience where we got to see uh, three women wearing the same shirt. Um, at times we knew that people were um, dressing up. They would tell us this is the first time they've dressed up, first time they brushed their hair, the first time maybe they put on makeup uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so we would see people in the ways that they would present themselves normally. And sometimes as, as here with Kim, 
um, we discovered that people were um, dressed wearing their, their Zoom clothes. So all business up top and uh, pajama casual on the bottom. Children are always children, uh, always bouncing and happy and, and, and kind of fun to try to get uh, photographs of. So a friend of ours, Sean, who was, uh, we knew from uh, Facebook, who was having a little bit of difficulty uh, trying to figure out what to do for his uh, 50th birthday since it happened in the pandemic. I think ultimately he canceled it, um, but this was us uh, showing up to at least capture a photograph of what I believe was a canceled birthday. So if you know Sean, I believe he's still 49. And sometimes we would spend more time with families uh, just because we had time and they were kind of had planned things. This is um, friends of ours, uh, Lester and Amain, and they clearly had uh, planned and thought out what their images would look like. So we got one in the front yard, one in the backyard, and both seemed to quote American Gothic. And so uh, we had so much fun with that that we um, noticed that uh, their one son, Luther, there you see is, is holding a sword and asked if they also knew this painting, um, the Oath of Horatii, which they did and um, indulged. And we made our own version of Oath of Horatii there. And you can see the, the women are, are really tore up by this. Um, we also ended up photographing five women who were pregnant um, at different stages of their pregnancy. In fact, two of them used our pictures it seemed like they used our post on facebook to announce to the bigger world that they were expecting a child um we will show you all five pictures and so since we've taken all of these pictures um all of the women have given birth um, our plan for the end of this artwork is um, for the very last pictures we take to be pictures of the same women holding their babies. And my hope is that the babies won't be walking by the time we're, we're photographing the women. Um, two of the people we photographed were Samantha and King. Um, and typically we would take the picture and then ask folks to tell us how they were doing. Um, and I would take notes um, uh, and try to write down everything they were saying. When we photographed Samantha and King, Samantha said that she had been writing something that day and she asked if she could send it to us. Um, so this was the first time someone actually wrote something on their own and sent it to us. Uh, and this is what she sent us. And I can hear Samantha's voice. And if you know Samantha, you, you, you'll be hearing her voice in, in your mind. But um, we were really struck by her words. Um, and so we asked Samantha if we could use her words as the main post introducing the images um, on that day. Typically, we wrote words that would um, sum up what was happening in Lexington, in Kentucky, or in the country on that day. But this was the first time we used a participant's words because we were really struck and moved by Samantha and her words. Um, and as we approached summer, um, we realized that people were spending less time online and more time outside. The weather was getting better. And so we transitioned from photograph daily, photographing and posting images daily to photographing a couple of times a week, or maybe even once a week, but working on what we called stories, um, series of images and narratives that were thematically linked. Um, and this is this picture is one of two um, mini early mini series. Um, so this is one of them, and the other one is Uma. Um, and we posted these pictures um, on the 28th of June uh, in celebration of Pride Month. Uh, and we actually asked both Patty and Shady and Uma to talk about Pride Month and what it means to them. Um, and this was part of our gradual realization that we had created a platform with these photographs and stories that we could use um, to highlight social justice movements and important moments in our national political life. So um, we another series we worked on um, is photographing DACA recipients. Uh, we'll show you a couple of the images. And this was following the Supreme Court's decision on June 18, 
when the Supreme Court rejected the Trump administration's attempt to dismantle DACA. Um, so um, we photographed uh, five or six people. We asked them to talk to us about what this decision meant to them. And we found out, Kurt and I found out, that we didn't know that much about DACA and that there were a lot of things that we were not aware of. Um, and so we learned a lot and we shared what we had learned through these narratives with um, folks on Facebook. Another series we worked on, um, which may be the largest series to date, um, is of local musicians, Lexington-based musicians. And we'll let you look at those images, but we'll just say we wanted to photograph and talk with uh, these folks mm -hmm. because we realized that their lives are uniquely impacted by the pandemic. Everyone is impacted, but most of them cannot perform or cannot perform in the ways in which they're used to um, and love to perform. And so we photographed them and we talked with them. This was, um, May was also um, the season of graduations. And so people reached out to us and asked us if we would go and take their pictures. And this was, uh, there were two graduates in this picture they were wearing their robes. Here's another family with one graduate, no robes, but plenty of yard decoration to celebrate. Um, the young woman who was graduating to Mommy and Hinano we actually had met through another artwork. We were really happy to be able to photograph them because the next day they were going back to Japan. Um, so to, Hinano had finished high school and they were returning to Japan. So we caught them um, just in the very last moment. Someone suggested that we photograph census workers as another group of people who um, I guess happen <laughs> once every 10 years. This is Jeff. And what was fun about photographing Jeff is that when we showed up, and Kurt mentioned, each of us will always take a picture, um, often one in front of the house, one behind. Um, when we showed up, Jeff knew exactly where he wanted to be photographed. So he led us to the back of his house. There was a crate. This crate was right there. He sat down, and this was his idea for the picture. It probably wouldn't have been the picture we would have taken, but we, we were really happy in the end. Um, and it was fun that he knew exactly what he wanted. Bob Morgan uh, is another person who had a very clear idea of how and where he wanted to be photographed. So he had prepared um, a space for himself in front of his house. We did that, take that picture and that's a beautiful picture and it's uh, on the website for this artwork. But we also took this picture, which we really like. So we thought we would share this as well. And Bob was part of a series of photographs of people who have weathered the pandemic living on their own, people who live alone, who are single. And we worked on that series because someone suggested that to us. In fact, a woman who had done the very same thing and she said it would be, it would be comforting for her to see how other people have coped with the pandemic, other single people living by themselves. And this is Clay. Um, Clay, and we'll talk with him about that, but he helped us a lot uh, with a series of photographs and stories um, focusing on the opioid uh, epidemic here in Kentucky. Um, and so we photographed people who had either lost family members or um, loved ones, friends to opioids and to addiction. And Brandy is also here. This is the picture we took of her, which actually she's the only person so far who has seen it because we haven't published it yet. But her picture is part of a collection which we will be publishing this evening, um, later this evening. And it's a collection of 10 photographs of Black Lexingtonians talking about what Black Lives Matter means to them. Um, so she was kind enough to participate and to um, reflect on, on Black Lives Matter. So, uh, as you already know, we're joined by Uma, Brandy, and Clay. And I think we're all going to turn on our videos now so that we can um, ask them some questions. The host, I think the host needs to let me stop share video. The, the same with me, yep. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so while everybody is um, kind of getting their videos turned on, I'll, I'll tell a little bit about the, the structure of the rest of this. So the, the three people that we asked to join us are people that um, during this project, so um, 
we, we know for different amounts of time. Um, but while we photographed them um, and we're arranging those photographs and afterwards, we realized that we could talk to them for hours and hours and, and be endlessly fascinated with, with their thoughts and ideas and, and what they have to say. And we realized that it would be great to have their voices here as part of this as well. So um, I'm going to ask a, a question of Uma first. So hello, Uma. Um, I should say to the Brandy and play as well. Um, so Uma, uh, and the, the question structure, just so everyone in the room, I, by room I mean everyone listening knows, is we'll kind of ask uh, in the beginning the same question of each uh, participant. But so Uma, we want to ask you first, like why you said yes. You could have said no. I'm sure a lot of people want to photograph you. Um, but why you said yes when we asked you to be photographed uh, as part of our uh, post about Pride Month. And also, if you can talk a little bit about um, how representation matters to you and some of the work that you did to affirm drag and drag queens throughout the pandemic. Well, not a lot of people want to photograph me. So. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but thank you for having me here. And I, I appreciate being a part of this. And hello to everyone. Um, why did it kind of, why did I say yes? I said yes, because it was an opportunity. And as a local drag artist, you don't say no to opportunities. Uh, you, you take on everything that you can. And um, I was just excited to do it. We were in the, in the beginning stages, or I guess kind of in the middle of the pandemic. And I was uh, just looking for something to do to get myself out there. You know, I haven't, I hadn't been working as a drag queen for a couple of months and um, it was a way to stay active in the community and visible. And I felt like as far as representation and visibility, a lot of people have preconceived notions of what a drag queen is. And so I thought it was important to be out there and visible, especially during Pride Month, that uh, drag queens are normal people too. You know, we, we live in houses, we, we live in apartments, we live here in Lexington, um, you know, we don't just exist on the stage. And um, we, we are just normal people. I'm a, I'm a pretty normal person. I just uh, use all the colors in the crayon box. Um, and as far as keeping myself uh, busy as a drag queen during COVID, during all of our quarantine, uh, at the beginning stages of March to June, I was in charge of a fundraising organization as a drag queen. Uh, we're a drag organization that fundraises through drag for other charities in the Bluegrass area. And I was the leader of the organization. I was the face of it and I was in charge of raising money. And it's pretty hard to do that. Um, when you can't have drag shows. So I had to be innovative and think outside the box, be creative. And what I thought of doing was doing live shows here in my home, in my kitchen, cooking. Uh, I did live paintings, uh, Bob Ross style. And we baked pies and all kinds of things. Um, we did live figure drawing, had a model here in the house and drew, uh, taught me being the educator, teaching people how to draw, how to bake, how to cook, how to paint, and raising money all at the same time. And um, that's how I kept myself busy and, and had a lot of fun. And um, I'm hoping I can ask a question of you while I have you on the line. Um, how did you and Carmena, how did you choose who to photograph, I mean, why would you go looking for a drag queen anyway? But how did you choose who to photograph or choose who would represent your art? Um, you know, that's something, uh, thanks for asking that. Uh, that's something that people asked us from the very beginning. Um, and I'm gonna, uh, first before I, I wanna share my screen to um, I think surprise you with a picture um, also was part part of this, this answer. So, um, I don't know if you remember this night. No. <laughs> um, we, we thought, okay, so Uma asked how we um, choose who we're gonna photograph. And 
generally the way in the beginning, we would only photograph people that invited us to photograph them um, because we wanted to make sure that we didn't surprise anyone. We didn't knock on anyone's door uh, in the time of the pandemic when nobody knew what a knock on the door meant. Um, and then we committed to photographing people that invited us or recommended to us. But we also worked really hard to make sure that we were capturing um, images of, of Lexington, a representative body of um, people that call Lexington home. And so when people would suggest someone that we didn't know, we always got super excited. And uh, someone we photographed said, I know who you could photograph, Uma Jules. And we said, no idea who that is, but we definitely want to photograph her because her name is great. And it turns out uh, we've photographed you before. Uh, this is from uh, 2018. We uh, went to the bar and, and took this photograph of you. And I am certain on that night, we probably asked Jenna or somebody else to, to identify you. Um, and thankfully she did. So, but generally um, we photograph specifically um, people who contact us in the beginning. And then once we move to stories, um, it's the same kind of thing where we try to understand that with musicians, the number of ways that um, the pandemic has affected musicians and do our best to make sure that we're not just showing pictures of musicians that we know personally, um, but musicians that um, we can reach out to through kind of the viral networks of, of friends and, and the first musician we photograph. So um, we, we choose uh, the people to photograph partially by suggestion, partially by request and always with an intention to make sure that we're representing a, a greater community of Lexington. Do you remember what performance you were doing at that time? No, um, I, I know I, I'm my own worst critic. So the first thing I see in that picture is that I'm not wearing nails. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so well, um, I know. I, I just before I ask Lay a question, I can say that maybe it'll jar your mind. You also did a Liza Minnelli number that same night. And I say that like, I assume that you can remember every single night all the way back to 2018 that you've done drag. Uh, I, I suspect that's not true. Um, yeah, Kurt, that's like a student saying to you, do you remember that one class when you made that joke about me train and you'd be like, I made that joke in every single class. I don't know which class we're talking about, Kurt. <laughs> or student. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I did. I did Liza just about every weekend for a couple of years. So, um, it obviously I'm I'm experiencing some kind of emotion. I'm really feeling it there. <laughs> Thank you, Uma. So Thank I you. want to ask Clay a question. Um, and Clay, you need to unmute yourself though, so you can uh, you can answer my question. Hopefully, hi, Clay. Hey, Krona. So Clay and I go, go. I had forgotten this Clay, but Clay was my advisee when he was at Trinity. So um, apparently I thought I was, I was wise enough to dispense wisdom and to guide Clay through Trinity in four years here. Uh, but Clay, can you talk about why you said yes when we asked you to help us with the series on um, people who have had different kinds of experiences with the opioid crisis? Absolutely. Um... Uh, for one thing, Kermena, I assume in concert and conversation with Kurt, uh, approached me not only because she knew that I had experiences and stories regarding this, but that I could put them in contact with other people. Um, because big surprise, people, there's a lot of stigma and people don't want to talk about the opioid crisis and addiction and mental health and all of those things. Um, and uh, where I have lost so many people, there is a certain survivor's guilt and a little bit of like sense of obligation to tell these stories. And um, so I, and it, it, I felt obligated, not in a bad way. Obligation has kind of a negative connotation, but yeah, I, and anytime this comes up, I feel it's not exactly light party fair in terms of conversation, but um, I'm ready to talk about it when people are willing to talk about it. Um, also, I'm assuming a little bit here, but like the other guest panelists, I, uh, I wanted to offer a testimonial for kind of a crisis within a crisis. Um, I won't simply repeat what I wrote, uh, and submitted for this project, 
but I care about this cause and I'm both worried and hopeful uh, regarding what can happen amidst the pandemic and, and you know, in perpetuity. Um, to make it a little bit more personal, when I was about 16, um, I grew up in Ashland, Kentucky, a uh, tri-state area, more or less like the, one of the opioid uh, pandemic like epicenters. And when I was about 16, and you know, this was 14 years ago, um, it was already a big deal there. Like it may not have been national news, but it was, it was surging there already. And uh, rumors started going around my high school that I was using pills and um, friends, sometimes old friends, just completely wash their hands of me. They didn't ask if I was okay or anything like that. They just knew that they didn't want anything to do with that. Um, and, you know, it hurt, but I mean, they were young, so was I. It still hurts, but I mean, that's just what happened. Um, I did eventually do opioids recreationally in college, uh, but I never developed a serious habit with it, thankfully. And I, I think basically my connection to others and people worrying about me is the only reason I didn't really succumb to that kind of addiction and lifestyle. Um, like it got to a point where I saw so many people fall from it that I couldn't enjoy it anymore. Um, but anyway, I, I participated in this project because I wanted to add both an affirmation and kind of a call to action. Um, it seems kind of kind of trite, but if you're struggling with addiction, even now, um, in the midst of this pandemic, when we can't really lean on each other in the way that we otherwise might, um, you can survive. You do have people that care about you. Um, you still have ways to communicate to others. Uh, some friends of mine from my hometown still talk to each other about how we can't believe that we're still here and that it just, we feel lucky and that it really is random as to who is still here in our community. Um, but we are still here and we're able to speak and talk about this thing that has taken so many from us. And I'm always going to stand up and do that. Um, but on a lighter note, uh, speaking of connecting to others, Kurt and Carmena, um, as you know, I really love meeting new people and um, just being social and like social butterfly things and all that. And you all have actually had this really rare experience of getting to meet a lot of new people right now. Like that's not, I mean, unless you're completely flouting safety protocols, you're not meeting very many new people right now. So I'm kind of envious, but I, I'm, all of your art projects, more or less, that I know about that you've collaborated on have been very social art projects. So you've always been meeting new people, but this one is very different. You're meeting them from a distance, you're meeting them for short periods of time, you're basically photographing them and that's about it. You know, like, I just, I wanna know what this, is, this experience has been like and how it's been different from other community oriented projects that you've done. Um, thanks, Clay. And, and thanks for um, connecting us with everyone that you did, for sharing your story as you did. Um, for anyone who hasn't um, read the stories um, from that, that post, uh, that it, it's a very heavy post and it's um, you know, made possible um, because of Clay's willingness to, to work with us. And you know, we talk about kind of collaborations in a number of ways. And I think that um, Clay sharing the trust that his friends have in him with us is why we were able to gather those stories. So thanks, Clay, for that. Um, and I do want to uh, kind of respond to your question about meeting people. But um, as I did with uh, Uma, I want to start with um, a picture that you, do, you, uh, you knew we took, but you might not remember uh, 
or you might not have anticipated um, seeing it tonight. Oh, why, why can't I go to the next screen? It's just frozen on Uma. Let me uh, try to figure that out. Uma, you seem to have kind of just taken over the computer. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. <laughs> People have called me a virus before. Yeah. Okay. Ah, so here we are. It, Clay, this is, this is a picture Clay allowed us to take for him for an earlier project. And I wanted to share it for a few reasons. One, because Clay uh, never ages. He, the, he's the same exact person as he is in this picture, which is, is incredible. His hair has changed color, but that's really it. Um, and also because this is how we, this is a project we did called um, Discarded Lexington. And this is how we tagged the images for that project and how we continue to tag them. But, um, but, but in response to Clay's uh, question about meeting people, and this Discarded was also a project that allowed us to meet a lot of people. Um, this is really an incredible part of the project um, that, that we don't take lightly um, by any means. Um, sometimes when we meet people, we meet them at, at kind of dark times in their, in their passage through the pandemic. And some, some days, especially earlier in the project, were pretty hard because people were talking about struggles. And some days we meet people um, like Jack and, and Finn here that, um, for one, I, I wanna say that I think Finn put his shoes on the wrong feet Two, as children, um, don't really seem to fully understand uh, the difficulties of the pandemic. And so they're interested in meeting us in the same way that they would ever be interested in meeting us, but more importantly, interested in showing us their pet worm that they just discovered. And, and we were there to photograph them because um, their mother reached out to us and asked um, if we could photograph at her house and that we photographed Jack and Finn at her house. Um, but specifically, she wanted us to, to take this photograph um, of her neighbor. Um, her neighbor is named Jackie, and um, she, she specifically really wanted us to, to capture and document um, Jackie's time uh, during this pandemic. And what I think is, is really interesting is the ways in which people care for one another. So um, not only did she ask us to photograph Jackie, but her house is directly across the street. And it was very clear not only, it would have been clear if she didn't tell us, but she told us directly, I'm gonna watch as you go over there and make sure that you don't get too close. And so we're meeting people, um, but also meeting kind of the, the lives around them, the, the people that they care for and, and look out for. So this is uh, Jackie who Carmena may remind, what was it that Jackie has made a lot of? Um, I think teddy bears from mohair. Teddy bears from mohair. Yes, 50. Um, we didn't see any of them, uh, but it, it's certainly easy to remember. So um, thanks, thanks for ask, asking that, Clay. And it is certainly an, incredible to meet people, although it's also an unusual way to meet people because we know we won't see them again until the end of the pandemic. You know, we don't go back after we photograph somebody. Um, and Brandy, hello there. Uh, now, Brandy, of, of the three uh, guests, is the, uh, the most recent person we've met. Uh, we actually met Brandy specifically uh, for this uh, photograph and um, really wondered ourselves aloud. Uh, sometimes we have a hard time stopping ourselves from wondering aloud um, how's, how it's possible we haven't met Brandy before, um, just because it seems like our paths should have crossed many times. And, and Brandy, I kind of want to start, I want to ask you the same question. Uh, which is ultimately, why did you say yes? You know, we reached out to you specifically to see, ask if you would be willing to be photographed and, and write a narrative to be part of our Black Lives Matter collection. And I wonder if you can answer why, why that seemed appealing to you and, and also talk a little bit about why just representation in general matters. You know, like for me, that is a very simple answer. Um, I participate in this project because my voice, and, because I have a voice and a platform that um, can reach folks and my story matters, um, just like your stories matter or the stories of other folks. Um, I believe that representation is um, at the root of all of our issues. The more we know, the better we know, the better we do, you know. Um, so. I'm a Lexington singer, I'm a teacher, I'm a speech pathologist. I use my voice for all of the things. So when you asked, I gave you a resounding yes, because what better way to use my voice, you know? Um, 
I think that it also all boils down to community and connectivity. So um, as you will read in the passage that I wrote, um, we are all interdependent and our stories matter and we are all um, functioning together. So that's why. Um, also as an artist, um, I'm also very much led by um, using my art to change the world. So I honor your doing that as well. Um, in doing so, I do have questions. I wonder two things. Um, one, how do you hope that your art influences the world? But also, um, how do you encourage your contemporaries or the people that you influence directly um, to stand up and speak out about all of these issues? Um, because the truth of the matter is that, you know, Uma's um, LGBTQ squared IA struggles are no different than mine as a person of color or Clay's as a person who's affected by opioid abuse um, and addiction, you know? So um, I just wonder how do you encourage other folks to use their platforms to make change that's meaningful for them? Thank you, Brandy. And Kurt, you misspoke a little bit, and Kurt will be the first to say that I always correct him when he's wrong. So that's one of my roles. Uh, and but sometimes we, when I'm not wrong. <laughs> sounds about right. <laughs> but we met Brandy because we are on a steering committee. Oh, that's yes. right. Yes, and Brandy spoke from the, uh, like instantly Brandy spoke about how much representation matters to her. And then we instantly said to each other, we have to ask Brandy if she'll, she'll be part of our artwork. So we had met her on a screen, but just, just maybe two weeks before we photographed her. Um, but yeah, Brandy, this is a really good question. So the qu first question about how we hope our art can make a difference. Um, for me, the answer is by humanizing people to each other because we all have preconceived ideas and some of them are wrong and some of them are damaging and harmful. Um, and for me, one, one example that comes to mind very quickly is um, people who are DACA recipients. We, um, we really wanted to photograph um, individuals who are DACA recipients and, and have them share their stories with, with us and with everybody who, who looks at our photographs and reads the stories. Because we kind of knew that we don't know a lot about DACA, but then reading their stories, we realized how imperfect DACA is and just how difficult their lives are, even though in theory, what we want is for DACA to be upheld. And we want more than that, but at the very least, we want DACA to continue, but their lives are very are made very difficult by DACA. So I hope that we were able to educate people about what DACA is and to humanize, to put faces to people who are you know, here because they're recipients of DACA. And, and frankly, I feel the same way about the Black Lives Matter post, which now I'm talking about something that hasn't happened yet, but maybe that will encourage people to check out um, Facebook later this evening. Um, again, there are a lot of different uh, ideas and some of them are wrong about what Black Lives Matter is um, and, uh, and, and what it does and how it excludes people. Um, and so again, we wanted to put faces to the, to the movement and to the idea and let people speak in their own words. And it was really important for us to, to, to invite black people into the space and, and ask you to talk about Black Lives Matter. Um, and we've tried to do that consistently with this artwork. Um, give the floor to people of color and to voices uh, that are not there are not white people who are um, squarely in the center of American society because white people get to speak a lot, um, way too much. Um, and so we've, we've wanted to do that consistently. So yeah, Kurt brought up the picture of Crystal and Ron and uh, one of their granddaughters. We, um, we wanted to mark Mother's Day when Mother's Day happened. And that was, that was in May, yes, May 9th. I, I have no idea when Mother's Day is usually like the culture around me is, is reminding me it's Mother's Day. So we wanted to mark it. And it was important for us that we invite a woman of color to talk about Mother's Day. And who better than Crystal, who is an amazing, amazing writer. And she wrote a beautiful and moving piece. And that was a very deliberate decision on, on our part to, to invite her to step into the space and, 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 and talk about her own mother and other mothers. So yes, so that was a very, very long answer to your question. Now, how do we encourage other people and, and young people to, um, to, to try and change the world for the better? I think that's what I heard you say. Yes. I think if someone's heart is changed, it's really hard for that person not to do something following that change. Uh, usually 
um, when you care deeply about something or when you begin to care about something, then you have to, you have to express that care. Um, and so my hope always is that um, in this case, our art, in my own teaching, um, I teach novels by um, marginalized voices within American society. And I have the same hope for my students reading the words of, of, um, of authors uh, um, from the social margins that um, if you have a change of heart, then that's going to lead to, to a lot more. And it's going to prompt you to try to make the world better for, for everyone, including for these voices. Did I answer your questions? You answered my questions. Thank you. Also, just a point of reference, not just young people, but people across the board, because it's not just young people that can make this change or that are responsible mm -hmm. for this change. Um, I really am here because I have a niece who's five and she deserves to inherit a better world from me and from you and from Uma and Clay and Kurt. So um, all of us, I think are responsible for that. And thank you for your role in it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brandy. So um, yes, uh, I should say that folks can see a lot more photographs, read the narratives, and listen to the audio that goes with them on the website for this artwork. And I want to mention that the audio is unique to this particular moment. So we're going to um, keep it on the website for the duration of the exhibit. And it's only there because we're in an election season, which we all know about. And hopefully everybody has voted or has made plans to vote. Uh, but voting requires all of us to consider what matters to us and what is the, the country we want to live in. So we ask folks to um, respond to this prompt, describe the America you'd like to live in. Um, and we're going to end this kind of more formal part of our uh, of tonight of the presentation with Genaro, who is someone we, we didn't know before we photographed him. He's a mariachi musician. Um, he um, teaches at Berea College. And so we want to end with his response to this question or this prompt, describe the America you want to live in. My name is Genaro Rascón. I've been living in Kentucky for three years. I'm a musician and an educator. Soy hijo de padres mexicanos. I want to live in an America that I can be proud of where people value country over party and don't fly literal flags bearing the name of their favorite politician in the same way that you would fly the flag of your favorite sports team. I want our country to live up to the ideals that it loves to espouse, but which in reality it has so often failed to uphold. I want to live in the America that I grew up hearing about, the shining city on the hill that stands as a beacon of hope to those seeking liberty and justice to the tired and poor and tempest-tossed. I want to live in the America that we pretend to be. I want that dream to be real. I believe that we're capable of becoming a nation that values diversity, intellectualism, and justice for all. Genaro is wonderful. So Clay, that's in response to your question, but when we met Genaro, I really wanted to collaborate with him. But here we are in the midst of a pandemic. And so I just can't wait for this pandemic to be over so we can do something with him and with Sandy. Uh, Sandy was is the woman standing next to him. So I think Anthony is going to see if, the, if folks have any questions for any of us here tonight. And if not, we can keep asking each other questions and, and responding to our own questions. Yeah, um, everyone watching the, the Q&A, you know, chat function is open. If you have any questions, please feel free to type them out for us. Um, while I'm waiting for people to, to type those, I had, had a couple of things that came up um, during the talk and, and thank you all, that was really wonderful. Um, the first one is something that I've I guess I've wondered from the beginning, um, from for Kurt and Cremena, you know, it's been scary, right? Like, especially in the beginning of the pandemic when we didn't know very much. And um, you, you pretty like rapidly entered this project. And I guess I'm wondering, like, were you afraid 
in especially are you afraid were you afraid and um you know how is it how do you deal with that yes. I, was I was going to say one of us is fearless <laughs> and i was afraid um yeah i there we went through a lot of different types of fear and and dealt with it in different ways you know early on nobody really knew what six feet meant and so people knew that you were supposed to stay six feet away from one another. But as someone who teaches sculpture and, and deals with uh, physical distances, I know what six feet looks like, and a lot of people don't. And, and so in the beginning, um, people would come up and it would be very clear they got too close. I made a, a stick uh, that I could lay down on the ground between myself and anyone I was photographing. And the stick said, this is what six feet looks like. Um, that We didn't have to do that for very long because people understood what it was like. Um, but but even even now, you know, um, Carmela has had to take a few photographs that I wasn't able to be there for because um, my son is uh, at home because he was contact traced, and and so I have been quarantining with him because my fear uh, throughout all of this is that we, that we become a vector. Like the the worst scenario for this artwork would be that uh, either one of us becomes a vector for uh, spreading the disease um, by taking these pictures. So. It's something that um, we've been thoughtful about from the beginning. Brian asks, is there an element of the community that you hoped to capture but didn't? So that's a question from the president of Transylvania University for people who don't know who Brian is. Thank you, Brian. Um, and I should say that he allowed us to take a picture, well, invited us to take a picture of him and his family in their, in behind their house, which was very generous of him. And not every university president would do that. Um, for you know, for a long time, we had wanted to photograph people impacted by the opioid crisis, and it wasn't something that the two of us came up with. There were two different participants who said to us, "You know, we are also focused on the on the global health crisis, but there are all these other populations that are really suffering because of it, and the opioid." Uh, epidemic is, is something that's, that's getting forget, forgotten. And one of them is Andrea James. She works for the mayor of Lexington. And we just had no idea how to reach people who were impacted. And we knew that it had to be through um, someone who is, is directly connected um, to folks in, in that community, if we can call it a community. And it is in some ways. Um, so we, we've done that. Uh, we, another group of people we haven't photographed yet. And I keep thinking it shouldn't be hard, but it, who knows? We want to photograph people in the medical field, uh, especially people who have had to deal with, with COVID patients. Um, so I think that that's something that we'll start working on um, after the current uh, collection of stories is up, stories and photographs. Great. Lewis asks, how can we inspire openness in sharing one's story to specifically people with radically different life experiences and perceptions? When is your eyes, or when is the time when your eyes were opened and you empathized with someone that you felt a little to no connection with and how did it change you? Um, <laughs> what a question. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really good question. And it's one that, um, you know, I'm gonna answer, um, about a time that my eyes were open and it, it changed um, the, the course of my artwork um, um, from that point on. But it was by someone that I did have some connection with. It was just that the connection was growing at the time. When um, I, the very first time I engaged with the drag community in Lexington, I photographed um, performers for a calendar. And I photographed one performer who was featured in the calendar. Her name was Natalie Gay. And Natalie, um, as a man, Natalie's name was Stephen Foster, and Stephen was a uh, worked at a hair salon, and and I would call and and ask for um, an appointment, uh, and Natalie, I could ask for Natalie or Stephen because Natalie, everyone knew Stephen was Natalie, and Natalie was Stephen, <clears throat> and it was never an issue, but at the kind of event where the calendar was released, Natalie came up to me uh, and and in tears uh, said to me, thanked me for the calendar and for working with the Imperial Court on the creation of it, because when she saw her picture in the calendar, it was the very first time she felt proud of herself. And this came from someone that I knew as proud, someone who was out to everyone. 
and to hear her say that um, made me realize something. I had been telling my students for years that art can change people's lives, but I don't know that I really had an experience that allowed me to see it until um, Natalie told me that. And so I think that really opened my eyes um, to, to be more thoughtful about even the people that you feel like you do know or you're getting to know. You know, I can piggyback on that, but also my life's experience has taught me that um, I am radically different than most people, you know, like any of us, you know, we are all very much individuals. And I think the best way to create space um, for other people to be themselves and to indulge in these communities is to just be yourself, to show up and be your best you, um, to not shortcut or die down anything or, you know, water it down to um, serve the needs of others. Um, that and we have to recognize that we're all human. So when we come to the table, we have our own experiences and we have our own background and our own communities, but we also have these commonalities um, and it, it just takes us reminding each other of that. Um, and that is easy to do when you just show up in yourself. You know, it's challenging, but it works. Um, so it takes practice. That's excellent. Thank you. Um, we have one more question and it's from Handy and they ask, um, did, did any of your participants ever get to meet one another and build relationships through this exhibition? In other words, did it provide a venue for people who wouldn't normally meet or encounter one another? It's a little bit difficult to respond for two reasons. One is that we just don't know. You know, people can contact each other through Facebook and we wouldn't know about it. The other difficulty is the pandemic. But we do know that one of the um, classical, we photographed actually a family of classical uh, musicians, uh, Margie and Benjamin. And, and we had just photographed Hanaro and Sandy, the mariachi musicians. And I was so excited about the mariachi musicians. I was telling all the other musicians about them, hoping that someone, it would resonate with someone. I actually also told Uma, you might be entertained by this, but I also told Shady and Petty, the, the drag queens we photographed about the mariachi musicians. I said to them, you have to do something with them. And afterwards, Kurt said, how, is, how are the mariachi musicians going to fit into a drag performance where you're lip syncing? Anyway, so, um, but when I mentioned Hanaro to um, Margie and Benjamin, Margie was really interested in that. And so we connected them on, on, on email and hopefully there'll be something happening in the future. And um, yeah, and also Anthony and I spoke about one of the printmakers Anthony is working with for the other show Marlon is hosting and how that person might find um, a way to work with Hanaro. And that's just one example that comes to mind instantly. I think if, if it wasn't a pandemic time, there would be a lot more and more direct connections that we would be aware of. It's just so difficult right now. There's also a happy byproduct of um, connecting, fostering community relationships, um, just even digitally. So when you post these photos and you post these stories, you also connect us with other people in our community and make us more accessible to those people. So even if you have not yet met these folks and we haven't had the opportunity, wait until the world opens up. Um, Lexington is becoming a more inclusive place just because of this. And I, and I, to add to that, I've I've only just met Brandy and Emma, but we've met now, which is very cool. And whether people that participate in the project or not, I'm I don't want to speak for Brandy or Emma, but I've had a lot of people contact me after. And Brandy, your post hasn't gone live yet, but like I, I've, I've had a lot of people contact me, and whether they're just trying to connect or saying something nice, nice about the post, whether it's other people that have participated in the project or not, I do think the project has fostered a general sense of reaching out, community, connection, all of that sort of thing, for sure, at least on my end of things. And for me personally, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, no, no. <laughs> I was just gonna say, it makes, it makes the world seem a little smaller and it's, it's wonderful to see people through these photos that I know in real life and maybe haven't had a chance to connect with and to see an update on them and, and see Crystal is doing okay, you know? And um, uh, 
there's so many other people that I've seen and, and, and it's just fun to see people that you know outside their house. Maybe you've never been to their place and just to, it gives you a, a, a glimpse into uh, people's private lives or personal lives that, that you may not get um, in, outside a pandemic. Also a support, you know, I feel an intense support system also, because now that I know your story, Uma, and Clay's story, um, we are so much more connected than we know, even still. So um, it's nice to know that I'm not alone or that these experiences are not just my own. And I don't, and I may be speaking on a turn here, but at least when we first spoke, Kerr and Kermana, um, the way that you talked to me about this exhibition was, that this was really only a part one and that there would be a sequel down the road post pandemic future where we, um, wherever that exhibition takes place would all be able to come together and we would have these moments that we've shared virtually that now we can, as Kermena always talks about, actually be able to embrace with one another. Kermena really loves to hug people is what I've picked up on. <laughs> And so I think that even if in this exact moment, people haven't had the opportunity to meet, my hope is that we will be able to come together and share more with a deeper understanding of each other post pandemic because of this work. Anthony, yes, it's a promise. We'll have, we'll have our big party after the pandemic is over. Yep. And they might be dragged there, who knows? Okay. performances. Yeah. <laughs> in mariachi music and the yeah. whole, yeah, everything. Um, we have two more questions and then we're gonna wrap it up for the night because I don't wanna keep all of you for, for too long um, and respect your time. But Zoe asks a question specifically for Clay, which is how would you like to have your storytelling dealing with people um, with addiction be able to basically em empower their understanding of addiction and what is it that you would like people to understand through those stories? Um, stigma is forced is one of the first things I would say. Um, I've, especially during the pandemic, I've tried to write and post a lot about um, mental health, addiction, substance abuse in order to uh, normalize it, if nothing else, for myself and for those reading. Sorry, that's my cat. Um, but uh, yeah, like I, I spent a lot of time not talking about it. I spent a lot of time kind of um, cloistered with other people that were experiencing it and society writ large isn't going to understand if that cloistering continues, if people get closed off into little clicks and all that stuff. Um, I don't know if I've properly answered the question, but yeah, like I think about it before you speak, but talk about it. Think about it before you write, but write about it get it out there in a thoughtful way because most of the criticism and the stigma is not thoughtful. So give it some thought, give it some care and get it out there and humanize. That's one thing that's, I guess that's the second tier is humanize. These aren't addicts. These are people. These aren't, you know, people that have undergone overdose or like you know they're they're not just overdoses they're not just numbers they're people they had family they had friends they had children and it's really important to remember that just like any other stigma thank you clay yeah the last question is actually not a question at all once i read it which is just to say from carol Thank you for sharing these stories and images. We pay more attention to lies these days than we do to beautiful truths. And you all shared your truth in a really beautiful and meaningful way, which I think is an excellent way for us to just to 
wrap up this evening. Thank you all for taking the time to share with us and for joining us. And to all of you watching at home, thank you for joining us this, this evening. Remember to wear your masks, stay safe, go vote if you haven't yet, and we'll see you all again soon.